Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Conwingo Baptist Church. Uh, if you're a visitor today, inside your bulletin, there's an area in here that says welcome. And then you can fill out your name and information there. We would just love to have a record that you were here today. Also, there's an area there where you can fill out prayer requests. And so it's, it's so good to have you here to worship with us. Uh, there are various announcements in your bulletin. Just a couple things here today. I want to say, uh, obviously, Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We're so thankful for, uh, for our moms. And we're so thankful for you all uh, being here as a witness to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren um, for the, the faith in Christ that you have. And so thank you very much for being here today. And I know there's some new moms, and I know there's some moms to be in here as well. And so we praise God uh, for the life that He continues to bring. Um, I want to say thank you for the ladies' tea yesterday, for those that were able to come out and enjoy that yesterday. For those who put it together and, and were responsible for it, thank you so much, uh, Tina and Diane, and, and so many that were that were helping out with that yesterday. Uh, thank you for that. We appreciate that, and it was a lovely time, I must say. Um, I went, hey, you know what? I'm going to call it the men, too. If you're an adult man, you did not come. And I want to say, hey, we, we're supposed to serve our ladies. And I know there's some men that were available yesterday that just simply did not come, and so... Um, it was just, and I say that because it's like two of us. We had like Lloyd and Alan. Alan was sick. I mean, Alan has Alan had multiple things. He just wasn't able. To, he was wasn't able to stay. And he came, and then we had a, a few younger kids that came and they helped out. Um, but I want to. I'm calling out the men. Hey, just like just like I just did. Call out the men. When we need your help, we need your help. And so, uh, so please, next time we we need help. All right. Um, there's a family fun night this Saturday, that's May 16th, uh, that'll be at 6 p.m., and so this coming Saturday, family fun night, hot dogs, games, movies, it's free, asterisks, <laughs> there, any donations, any money that they get is going to go to the renovation for the youth room, so uh, come on out, have fun, enjoy, you don't have to pay anything, but if you'd like to give a donation, we would certainly appreciate it, please do, and all that money is going to go right to the, uh, right to that project for the youth room. Speaking of building projects, if we can get the uh, brother Josiah, I know he, he's going to take this over and if you remember we were going to uh, raise the roof and so Josiah hold it up nice and pretty, look at that. It is paid. Now Josiah was the first one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we praise God for that. That was like a 40,000 around uh, project that we had to get done for this roof. And as we were considering, you know, who's going to rip it up and everything, you know, this really is an investment in that future generation. These are those believers that, that are going to be here at this church, God willing, uh, long after we're here. And so we wanted a, a young believer to come up and, and rip that up because this really was an investment for them. And it came by the faithfulness of you today, just like we have faithful saints in the past who have done the things that they needed to do to, to give us the house we have today. Uh, we need to continue to do the same thing. And I praise God because you look around, you know, God through you did that. And the faithfulness of your giving was allowed us to put this roof on that's a phenomenal roof. And it will last us. We've got a 50-year warranty on it. And uh, praise God for all of that, how we worked all that up. We raised that roof, and we thank God for that. The Deacon of the Week this week is Brother Tom Stevens. And so if you've got uh, questions or anything, you'll just call the church. Hey, I need somebody to pray for me. Call brother. Uh, call the church. They'll give you Brother Tom, and he will uh, help you out. Then I know he's, he's willing and ready to help you. Prayer request today. Mrs. Jean Walter is continuing to heal. And so just be in prayer for her as they are uh, looking at a heart rate right now, just kind of getting her heart rate under control. Uh, but pray for her as she's at Christiana uh, in that hospital. She had to be transferred there uh, because of some health issues that she was having. And so um, just be in prayer for her. They want to get her into a rehab center soon so she can start rehabbing that hip replacement that she just had as well. Uh, John Blevins called me this morning. Uh, his mom, Shirley, is going to the ER. And so please be in prayer for, uh, for John's mom, Shirley. And Olivia told me that her uncle 
uh, was, her uncle Kevin was almost hit by a tornado. And so we want to uh, pray for that. There's a lot of that going on. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. Earthquakes. We're seeing tornadoes. We're seeing all sorts of drought and all these things. And scripture is very clear what that means. Um, I want to give a praise this morning uh, for the National Day of Prayer that we had. Uh, many of you were able to go out and, and pray with other believers. And we praise God for that, that we have a National Day of Prayer. That's something that we do. And I also want to praise, uh, we weren't able to do it last week, but I praise uh, that Eden and Corey and uh, baby Liam are here and, and they were able to make it up here. So we praise God that you all are here and the Eden that you'll be staying with us. We're very, very, very thankful for that. Uh, back in Connor, we go. All right. Are there any new requests or any updates to any prayer requests that you have? Yes, sir. Dylan, want to pray for Dylan, your friend. <coughs> Any others? Any other prayer requests or updates? Yes, ma'am. Um, for the family of Lacey LaRose in Texas, there was a girl I went to high school with. She passed away this past weekend. Um, she was shot down. For a long time, long time. Pray, pray for her. Family. Pray for her as she was shot. Right. Yeah, she yeah. passed away. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Gabriel's not feeling so today. <coughs> Are there any other prayer requests or praises? Yes, Lori. Um, hey, praise God. <coughs> any others? Any back here? Prayer requests, praises? God's doing something in your life you want to share? Yes.
does not have the rest of the service blessings and peace. Jesus name, yes. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
give the God Girls one more round of applause. Did they do good? Well, here's a little something different for us. We're going to sing some scripture this morning. TJ, can I get the next slide, please, sir? Psalm 18, verse 3, says, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. This song is called, I will call upon the Lord. We'll go through it once. You guys will pick it up. It's super easy. And then I want you all to sing. Not just mouth it. I see a lot of you mouth it. See? Pretty easy. Let's, let, let's lift this up this morning. Ready? I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies, I will call upon the Lord. The Lord living and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord living and blessed be the rock and let the God
the house and to serve you and to worship you. And now we come to that special time in the service when we bring back the tithes and the offerings that you also commanded us to do, so that there will be need in your house, so that there will be monies to finance the operation of this church and to go forth around the world to help the other nations, Lord, who need to hear your word. As we come down to that time, help us, Lord, to be faithful, be trustworthy, and to most of all be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, we ask you.
That's the first card. There we go. From what seemed to be his waist up, I saw a gleam like amber. Not that amber. <laughs> With what looked like fire, he closed it all around. From what seemed to be his waist down, I saw what looked like fire. There was a brilliant light around him. Next slide. The appearance of the brilliant light all around him was like that of a rainbow and a cloud on a rainy day. This was the appearance, the form of the Lord's glory. When I saw it, I fell face down and heard a voice speaking. Oh 
continuation of this series we're going to be doing all year called email, and email stands for epistle mail, and the epistles are the letters that were written to the early church to tell them, hey, this is how you're supposed to act, this is how you're supposed to think, these are things you do, this is what you don't do, it all centered around Christ. Today the message is called the power of His Spirit. And we're going to see that the Holy Spirit was integral and continues to this day to be an integral part to what makes our church and any church tick and talk. So as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 to 23, we're going to finish out Ephesians 1 and we're going to ask you one more time to stand at the reading of God's Word this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, starting out in verse 13, it says, When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in Him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. And this is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of his inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His vast strength. He demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising Him from the dead and seating Him at His right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Let's pray. Father God, what a glorious and magnificent God that you are. Father God, thank you so much for sending your Son that we might see, as Ezekiel talked about, this form of one like a human, but, oh, clothed in rainbows and majesty. God, we see everything in you that is holy and right and just. You're the only one who deserves holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty. Father, we know that you've blessed your word. We ask that you would bless this time as we worship you and learning your word and applying it to our lives. Father, be with us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first section that we're going to look at today is called Seal and Down Payment. Remember, we're looking at the power of his Holy Spirit. This first section is Seal and Down Payment. We see this in verse 13, it says, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. In this verse, we see two whens. We see when you heard, and we see when you believe. Uh, what did you hear? You heard the message of truth. That is the gospel of your salvation. Literally, the good news of your salvation. And then it says, and when you believe, believed in what? Believed in Him, that's Jesus Christ. Hearing does not save. Sitting in church does not save. Believing in Jesus Christ, because Jesus does save. <laughs> that moment a person believes in Him, that is Jesus, they are what? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. This indicates a security. This indicates authentication and approval. It indicates a certificate of genuineness, an identification of ownership. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says, 
You and I belong to Yahweh God. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In this verse, it, it speaks about a promise. It says you are also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, when did God promise us to send His Holy Spirit? Well, many times. But let's look at what Jesus says in John 15, 26. Jesus says, When the Counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify about Me. This is the Son saying that His Father will send His Spirit. This is the Trinity wrapped up in one verse. God promised that He would send His Holy Spirit, so Jesus does the same because Jesus is God. He promises the Holy Spirit's coming. Well, when it came, Paul says, man, we've got the promised Holy Spirit. For, verse 14, He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. A down payment is that initial pledge that someone makes in order to ensure that that purchase is secured. And that purchase is secured to that purchaser when they make that pledge. I want to buy something. Here's my down payment. This is proof. It's mine. I'm securing this. This is going to be mine. The Holy Spirit is given to us by God as His pledge of eternity in His kingdom. This is a relationship which is our inheritance. Like we talked about last week, this inheritance that God gives us as His adopted children. His Holy Spirit is given, it says, for the redemption of of the possession. Redemption is that word that is, that is a setting free by paying a ransom price. This is the idea of buying someone back from slavery. You are God's possession because He bought all of us back from sin and death. We were redeemed from a death. It's not like we were struggling. It's not like we were so close, but we barely missed out. No, we were dead in our transgressions. And now consider this phrase here. It says, to the praise of His glory. Look at verse 6. It says, to the praise of His glory. Look at verse 12. The Messiah might bring praise to His glory. And then verse 14 again. To the praise of of His glory. The whole process of God baptizing us with His Holy Spirit brings praise to His glory. A word on the word baptism. The word baptize is from the Greek word and it means immerse. That means completely indwelled and encapsulated. Completely surrounded. That's what baptize means. Immerse. You and I, that moment that we believe, God's Word says we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Other passages say we were baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is not a denomination. This is a biblical truth. God, the Holy Spirit, completely indwells His people. And we are completely submerged in the love of Jesus Christ. Bring praise to His glory. Verse 15 and 16, it says, This is why. Since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. He starts out, he says, this is why. There's a reason for the things that we do as Christians. There is a reason. And see, if you look at your life or you look at some of the things that you may do as a Christian, can you go to God's Word and say, yeah, here's why I do it. See, we can look at God's Word. Hey, we say, please stand and read God's Word. We can look at God's Word and find that. We can look at God's Word and say, well, why do we sing songs on Sunday morning? We can look at God's Word and we can see that. Why do we read God's Word and teach it and preach it? We can see in God's Word. That's what we do. Think about the things you do as a Christian. There ought to be a reason, and that reason ought to be Jesus Christ. Not man, not tradition, not anything else. It ought to be Jesus Christ, who says, this is why. And then verse 16, he never stops giving thanks and why he remembers them in his prayers. The presence of God's Holy Spirit moves Paul to pray for his people. 
Look at what Paul heard about these Christians. He had heard, he says, your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Have people heard about your personal faith and love? In your life, do you think people have heard about your faith and about your love? Because it's one thing if we go around and tell everyone what we believe. And hey, praise God if you do. If you're spreading the gospel, you tell people, man, Jesus, you know, he died on the cross for you. You're a sinner. You need to be saved. Praise God if you're doing that. We ought to do that. That's commanded. But it's a whole nother thing that I think is even more powerful when somebody else sees our faith and then they have to tell other people about it. That's a powerful thing. Has anybody ever come up to you and said, man, I know this person, they are just like on fire. Every other word they say is like Jesus. They tell you about someone else's faith. Do you think people that know you, that know you best, you think they're talking about your faith for all the saints, your faith in Christ and your love for all the saints? We should be so moved by the reality of what Jesus did that we have to live out our faith. We should give thanks to God for those saints in our lives that, that shine for Jesus that we have to tell other people, you've got to meet this person. You've got to see the love they have for Christ. And we should remember to pray for those believers. So the first point today is that His Holy Spirit provides the power to seal us for His glory. His Holy Spirit provides the power to seal us for His glory. The second section here today is called Wisdom and Revelation. Wisdom and Revelation. It says in verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord and Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Okay, so Paul remembers to pray for the saints, and that's good. We should remember to pray for the saints. But what are we praying for God's people? He says, a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And he says it as a gift. He says it, that God, the Father, would give you a spirit. This is a gift. It has to come from God. Now, is this just for like random, deeper things in the universe? Is it about a person becoming one with all? Is it about if a tree falls in the woods and no one's around to hear it? Doesn't make any noise? Is this about that stuff? Nope. It says, in the knowledge of Him. Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge that's the understanding of Jesus Christ. And that is the most noble pursuit. The prayer speaks of two components that are needed in this function of knowledge. And the first, as we've said for this section, is wisdom. What do you and I do with this knowledge that we have? You can hear about Jesus, and that's great. But what do you do with that knowledge? I may know that Jesus teaches that hating someone... To him, is the same as murder. I may know that. I may hear it. Okay, hating somebody is like murder. Okay. But it's going to take the wisdom of God to recognize the hate in my heart and the hate in my life. And it's going to take wisdom to forgive the people that I found that hate for. The second thing is revelation. It's the same word as apocalypse. It's a disclosure of the necessary component of knowledge. So I may know that the Bible is all about Jesus, but it requires revelation from God the Father in order to see with understanding and with clarity Jesus as He truly is. That does not come from study or from man knowledge. It does not come from us. You will only see Jesus as Jesus really is from His Spirit of wisdom and revelation. So in other words, we need God if we ever expect to get it. Verse 18 and 19, it says, I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the glorious riches of His inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His vast strength. 
this verse, which is a big long verse already, is actually a continuation from verse 17. He's continuing that prayer. It's just in the Greek, it just continues on. He says, the perception of your mind, that perception of your mind, that is literally the eyes of your heart. The eyes of your heart. Where scripturally that heart, that, that soul, that's the very center of what a person is, like you would call it personality. The very center of us. So it's the vision of our soul. It's our soul's ability to look and to see. It's a continued process of a past experience. Because he prays that our vision would be enlightened. In other words, that our soul would now begin to see light. The, the, the dark things in the shrouded part of our lives, where we look around and we see dark things and say, I don't get it, I don't understand. He's saying that the very depth of who we are would be able to see Christ and see life just as we were meant to see it. That's enlightened. There's three specific truths that he wants us to be enlightened to. He wants our vision of our soul to see three things. What are they? What is the hope of his calling? What are the glorious riches of his inheritance? And what is, verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Now I want to consider each of those three truths that we're supposed to see. Let's look at those as if they were questions. Okay, so we go back. Question one. Okay, well, what is the hope of his calling? What is the hope of Jesus' calling? The hope of Jesus' calling as the chosen one of God is found in the gospel. And it is eternal life. That is the hope. See, there may be some sitting here, you say, I look at my life, I see no hope. It's broken. It's down. It's in the dumps. I don't see a way out. What is the point? And we say the only hope found in all of the universe and even outside the universe is Jesus Christ. That's the only hope we have. Look at Luke 4, 43. It says, but he said to them, this is Jesus, but he said to them, I must proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also because I was sent for this purpose. Jesus' calling was the gospel. And the gospel is the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ. So you can look at the things going on in your life and say it's temporary. This will pass. I will die one day. But Jesus never dies. And those in Christ Jesus will never die. We'll look at that later. So question two. What are the glorious riches of his inheritance? Last week we talked about our inheritance that we get through Christ. So what's Jesus' inheritance? Well, the glorious riches of Jesus' inheritance as the Son of God is the value of all authority. Now think about that. We say here on earth, right? Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. It's not that way with our God. The value of Jesus Christ and the fact that he has all authority is ultimate power and ultimate authority and ultimate riches and ultimate glory. Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What are the riches of his greatness? If you're going to put a dollar and cents amount on it, it's all things in existence. That's the value of riches. All things are His. So then let's look at the third question. What is the immeasurable greatness of His power? What is the immeasurable greatness of His power? The immeasurable greatness of Jesus' power as the resurrected Lamb of God is seen in infinite worship. You say, how great is something? How great is it? Well, well how do people pay attention to it? When people see it, what do they do with it? Let's look. So fitting that we sang that Revelation song this morning. Revelation 5, 11 to 14. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Okay, so it's in heaven. The angels are there. The living creatures are there. Some living things. And then elders, some people. Are there. All people, all things, all. How many? Their number was countless thousands. 
So that's where it stops, right? No! Plus thousands of thousands. And they said with a loud voice, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive a few things. Let's look. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Now, if the greatness of Jesus Christ causes every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them to worship, then it must be immeasurable. It must be infinite. Those three truths are given to us, it says, according to the working of his vast strength. That word vast is a mighty power to overcome resistance. Things come up and they try to resist. This vast is a mighty power and it overcomes resistance. There's nothing that's going to get in the way of Jesus Christ and his mission. That word is only applied to God. In the Marine Corps, we had to sign off our work uh, with masks. You know, we would go out and do work, and we would have to come in, we would sign it off. And we would sign it off, okay, I torqued these bolts, or I witnessed them torquing these bolts to so many inch pounds, and we would have to sign off in accordance with, you know, the 560, 200 publication, whatever it was. You'd have to sign it off in accordance with some publication. And in that publication, at the beginning of it, it would say, this publication is authorized to do work on Marine Corps aviation <coughs> equipment. The authority of the written publication proved the authenticity of the work that was signed off. Therefore, if we look at this verse, if anything is done in accordance with the working of this mighty, vast strength of God, then it is done or as we would say in the Marine Corps, D, U, and buddy, it's done. <laughs> so then the second conclusion point is, His Holy Spirit provides the power to reveal Jesus' hope, His riches, and His greatness. And the Holy Spirit can do that in your life. The final section here is the right hand and the head. Verse 20 to 21, it says, He demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising Him from the dead and seating Him at His right hand in the heavens far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Verse 20, God demonstrated His vast strength by what? By raising Jesus from the dead and what? Seating Jesus at His right hand in the heavens. Let's put our reality goggles on. Let's put our reality goggles on in this church today. Let's look at things as they really are and, and consider them from the perspective. Like, we're talking about real stuff here today. Let's, let's think about it this way. What does it take to raise a man from the dead? Somebody who has already passed and already gone. You can't. It is impossible. When they are finally gone and finally rested, especially as time goes on, it's not happening. And in fact, think about it this way, in contrast with the power of men, the more powerful that we get as mankind, the more people we send to the grave. The power of God is to bring people back in eternal life. And then seating Jesus in heaven. Really, think about this. What would it take for a person to enter that dimension of heaven, to enter that place where only God can be? What would that take for us to do? There's no rocket ship. There's no slingshot that's going to get us there. We can't do it. And if we got there, we can't even approach the throne without the blood of Christ covering us. And if we do approach, we're going to be just like the men and elders and angels. We're going to be on our face. We're not going to be seated next to him as God Almighty. It is a further journey, and it is a higher privilege than we can possibly imagine. That's how God demonstrated his power. By raising one from the dead and seating him right next to him. This is what I can do. I can take a poor, homeless, crucified man and watch what I can do. Now, of course, this is God Almighty in the flesh. God was showing us. He can do things that you and I cannot. So verse 21, it says, far above. 
He isn't saying that it was so close and, and just barely almost. He's saying it's not even possible. He's so far above. It's not even, it's not even close. It's not possible. If Jesus is above all these titles mentioned, he must be God. If he's far above every ruler, far above every authority, every power, every dominion, every title, he must be God. And he says, not only in this age, but in the one to come. Another age is coming, brothers and sisters. Another age is coming. That age is the reality of everything we live in. It's not staying here. When earth and everything on it and in it and around it and so forth is gone and destroyed, another, ed, another age will be created. Oh, and by the way, Jesus will be greater than that age too. And impossibly greater at that. So verse 22 and 23, He put everything under His feet and appointed Him as head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Even Jesus' feet are above everything ever. His lowest point is higher than our greatest expectation. And this great Jesus is the head over everything like that it says for the church. The church is the, the collection of saints, all those who put their faith in Christ. But those things that are for the church is everything God gives His people as ministries and opportunities. So there is not a single square inch of either this personal church body or this church body or universally the church body. There's not a single square inch that is either mine or yours. We are not the head of His ministries. Jesus is the head over everything for the church. Jesus' body was resurrected. He says that in verse 23. He says the church, which is His body. Jesus' body was resurrected. Those who put their faith in Jesus are baptized by the Holy Spirit, and we will be resurrected too. We will come back from the dead. Death will not be able to hold us either because of Christ and His power. We, the church, then are owned and operated by Jesus. We're not a business. We're a body. And we're not identified by our biology. We are identified by our theology that teaches that Jesus is God, even the Son of God, to the glory of the Father. Now that last part says the fullness. But of course, you and I don't fill Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because it goes on to say that He's the one who fills all things in every way. So we don't fill Jesus. Another way to look at this is that the fullness is better understood as a prophetic completion of this covenant that God made between Him and man. You and I are a completion of a prophecy. Have you considered that? We say we're Christians, we say we believe in Christ, but have you considered the prophets and the law that spoke about a covenant and you are living in that covenant as a completion and a fulfillment of a promise that God made? We rejoice in the truth of that. We are filled with Christ by His Spirit and finally it says Jesus who fills all things in every way. Another way to look at that and pay attention please closely there is not a way that you feel empty that God cannot make whole. Christ can come into your life and fill in the gaps and make things whole. That's all He does. So the third concluding point is that His Holy Spirit provides the power to deal with our emptiness. His Holy Spirit provides the power to deal with our emptiness. God raised Jesus from the dead to prove death is not something you have to be afraid of. He said in His right hand to say, look, I've got everything under control. Whatever storm you're going through, whatever it is in your life, you say, man, I just don't know how I'm going to get over this or through this. It's empty. Jesus fills that in. Jesus is that answer. We're going to have a moment of invitation. This invitation is a time for you to respond in obedience to whatever it is that God is telling you to do. 
If you've listened to God's word and you've heard him, I know, I know what God is saying to me right now. It could be that you need Jesus. Are you unsure of where you're going to go when you die? We learned today the Holy Spirit seals you. You will be His for eternity. Are you unsure of who Jesus really is? The Holy Spirit reveals who Jesus really is. Are you unsure of why you feel empty inside? The Holy Spirit deals with our emptiness. He provided it and He proved it with Jesus on the cross. He proved it with Jesus resurrected and seated on the throne. God saved you and you just need to repent, confess, and believe. And you too can be saved. So in a moment we're going to stand up. And if you know that God is telling you to come forward, to receive Christ as your Savior, to be forgiven, and to be sealed by God, I'm going to invite you forward. If you've been saved and you have not been baptized, and you know I need to follow in obedience to what God's Word says, you come forward. And finally, if you know that God's brought you here to be a member of Conowingo Baptist Church, you come forward. We'd love to talk to you about that. At this time, please stand up as we pray for this moment of invitation. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, this, this is your time to work in the hearts of those that are here today. There may be some who in the past have, have sat in the pew and they stayed right where they are and they haven't wanted to come forward for one reason or another. They have not listened to you and been obedient. Father God, I pray that you would draw them forward and, and draw them up. Father God, all we ask is that as you lead, the people right here today would just listen and do what you tell them to do. We pray and ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, who makes all things whole. In his precious name we ask. Amen. You come forward as God leads you.